What is up, Z-Pack? It's your boy, Dr. Zubin Nemanja, a.k.a. Z-Dog MD, and we are live and direct out of Z-Studios today with Dr. Charlie Seltzer, MD. He is board certified in obesity medicine, and he's a clinical exercise physiologist, and he is going to teach us, importantly, he also used to be rather large, and now he's not. He's going to teach us how we might be able to do that, too. Dr. Seltzer, what's up, brother? Dr. Z, thanks for having Ooh. me, man. Thank you, man. Hey, you, where are you based? Philadelphia. The Philly! And you went to Jefferson Med? Jefferson Med and Crozier Chester for internal medicine residency. And the reason you're on my show is you reached out and you've done these like parody songs and have like this secret rap career and all this other stuff. I dropped out of medical school for three months to make a rap demo. Um, if I didn't, I was going to regret it for the rest of my life. But the music business is competitive, so... <laughs> Back to practicing my day job. Brother, the game is to be sold, not to be told. You know what I'm saying? So instead, it's interesting because you, you kind of grew up overweight and somehow got into obesity mess and lost a ton of weight. Mm -hmm. I had food issues my entire life. It didn't really manifest as obesity until I was a little bit older in my junior and senior year in college. Um, so you were, you, were, you were normal weight until then? I had been up and down a little bit in high school, but in college was when I really blew up. Yeah. The alcohol, the drinking, the the everything that you do in college. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah, bro. Mm -hmm. That sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. We should party sometime, Charlie. These two look like they're still in college, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Z, <laughs> tell Charlie about when you used to be fat. <laughs> so I was a very uh, overweight child to the point where, you know, my mom was loudly asking for the husky section at Mervyn's, which was the euphemism for the, for the fat kid section. And so I feel you. And I actually ended up losing weight later in, in junior high, high school. Uh, I think I might have even had developed a little bit of an eating disorder where I really just didn't eat. I starved myself mm -hmm. to death. Um, but so tell me, so you, you, you started to balloon in college. And then I'd gone up and down. I'm trying to follow every diet out there. Atkins, South Beach, I forget what was popular back then because I'm old now. Um, <laughs> nothing worked. It was so, the Thundercats diet. Yeah. It was something. Yeah. And nothing worked. I would go right back to where I was before. You know, whenever the diet finished, I was done. Um, then right back to where I was. And then at 240, um, knowing that I wanted to get into weight loss, no one was going to take weight loss advice from a fat doctor. So wow. I was like, you better get it together um, and figure out a way to do it permanently. So here I am now. Do you think that's true that nobody wants to take advice from a fat doctor? Because I've heard that and then I've heard other people go, well, at least this doctor understands my struggle. Yeah, I think that maybe that's good, mm. but I think that somebody who understands your struggle and has figured out a way to not be obese would probably be the best person to take advice from. It says you're board, you know, you're board certified in obesity medicine. Like, how do you do that? It's an informal fellowship. There's mm. two years of obesity related treatment after residency, which has to be either in internal medicine and family medicine, maybe mm. OB, GYN too. Um, and then they do a 50 chart review, you have to pass a test, and then you get certified. Got it. So it's not just uh, eat less, exercise more. Boom! I'm an obesity expert. Um, it kind of is. <laughs> Wait, is it? Is a calorie a calorie a calorie? I think that a calorie is maybe a calorie is a calorie. You have mm -hmm. to understand, like, there's a threshold calorie requirement that everybody has. We need a certain amount of calories for our brains to work, for our lungs to move, um, to pass food through our GI tract. It doesn't matter what your hormonal makeup is or anything. If you go below that necessary level of calories, that energy has to come from somewhere. Mm. And it'll come from fat or muscle, and you will see weight loss if you drop below that level. Mm. Mm. So what's the, uh, the exercise component of your training, though, uh, is something special because there's, you're the only doc in the country to hold this dual sort of certification. Yeah. The exercise is not important to lose weight. I think it is. Well, I take that back. Mm. It's important because it gives you the proper mindset to do the nutritional stuff that you need to lose weight. Yeah. But there's a million studies out there which show if you try to rely on exercise to lose weight, you'll fail. And oftentimes, you'll gain weight doing that. Right. Right. That's why I don't do CrossFit ever. Also, it's hard. Also, I'm intimidated by the guys. Also, I'm intimidated by the girls. They're strong. They are strong. I try to stay away from the boxes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what is the role of exercise? If you just restrict your calories and don't do anything else, yeah. a lot of the weight that you lose will be muscle. If you can engage in a resistance training program, you'll keep your muscle and lose mostly fat. I think also it's very difficult to just set a goal of, I want to lose weight. Over time, it'll fizzle out. You'll start to go back to your old habits. But if mm -hmm. you can use exercise to create a goal for yourself, like I want to squat 200 pounds or I want to complete a 
5K or something. It'll keep you motivated to follow the nutritional plan that you need in order to gain or in order to lose weight so that you can do well in that event. So it's a discipline factor, it's a maintaining muscle factor, maybe some insulin resistance component to it? Yeah, I mean, definitely. We know that, that weight training will improve insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. But again, when you look at it as a whole versus weight loss or fat loss, that is the most important thing. So I'm careful not to frighten somebody away from weight loss because they don't want to exercise. Mm -hmm. So you can do really good things to your insulin, your cholesterol, your C-reactive protein, if you just lose body fat. We can worry about exercise later if you really don't want to do it now. Well, so, so it's interesting because we were talking offline about everything causing cancer. But one of the biggest things that causes cancer in the U.S. is obesity itself. Yeah, without question. There's a number of different cancers, more than I can remember, that whose risk is increased with, with adiposity. Um, we know breast cancer recurrence is independently correlated. So when a woman comes in post uh, mastectomy and says, I want to keep my breast cancer recurrence down, I want to stay away from this food, that food, and that food, mm -hmm. but they're 50 extra pounds overweight, I'll say, listen, let's get this weight off because that is probably what's going to cause your breast cancer recurrence way more than whether you eat a soy nut here and mm -hmm. there. Well, here's the thing, you're asking them to do something that's classically so damn hard. So uh, my thinking is, if you're doing something that's making you overweight, the more you change, the less likely you are to succeed. Mm. So I say, let's change as little as possible. So when I got into my thing, I was like, listen, I'm not gonna give up jelly beans. I've tried to give up jelly beans every fourth day, every Monday for seven months. This is the Monday, I'm giving up jelly beans. Well, we're Jewish, so it starts on Tuesday. Yeah, right, right. Got and it. I was like, you know what? That's not gonna happen. So let me figure out another way to do it. I step back and I know a calorie is a calorie, probably. And I know that if I eat jelly beans and control for the calories, I can lose weight. And I can also be happy doing it because if you're restricting yourself or eating grilled chicken and eggplant every four hours for the rest of your life and you're lean and you're probably gonna be miserable and then mm. you lose it life anyway. So what's the That's point true. Of that? Yeah, because life is a failure. So you would so you would just eat jelly beans then? Is that what I'm understanding? I would control my macronutrients. So I had a protein number and a calorie number. Yeah. And once I hit that protein, I tried to make up whatever I could with the food that I liked to eat, and that kept me from going off the deep end. I see. So it allowed you the kind of joy in eating that you were used to. Yeah. And it, it's a, if it fits in your macros plan. I mean, this isn't new. People out there do it. You're just making things fit in your numbers. And I think. Ideally, it's great to eat non-processed vegetable, fruit, and whatever, but I know at nine o'clock at night when I come home and I just put my kids to bed, I'm not gonna feel like prepping food the next day. Mm -hmm. So if I can get some beef jerky and maintain really lean body weight, I'm gonna probably be healthier than if I try to do that for three days and then fail and go hit McDonald's and house two pints of Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> <laughs> well, a related question, willpower, is that a thing? Um, it's definitely a thing. Um, I think it's overrated mm -hmm. and I think the people who try to rely on willpower for weight loss are either going to fail or end up miserable, like I said. If you have to white knuckle your life to not eat a steak or whatever, then you lose. And like if you're lean, great. Um, being able to enjoy food, because food is social and it's a reward. And once we stop, stop trying to say that that's not the case, because mm -hmm. it is, you know, then we can work within the confines of the real world and mm -hmm. not in some fantasy land you know, where you know, research says something should be done, but it's entirely unpractical in mm -hmm. most people's real lives. What, you know, in the setting of that, so there's a nurse, she's, you know, 30 pounds overweight, she has a really stressful job, there's a lot of crappy food available, there may be a component of stress and comfort eating, what would you say to her, or him? I mean, I think you gotta address all the underlying issues like stress, sleep, all that other stuff. But specifically with regard to food, if you're at the nurse's station working overnight, there's gonna be donuts there. Yeah. It's impossible to think you're going to go the rest of your career without eating one of those donuts. By the way, you just violated Jayco just by talking about donuts at the nurse's station. Oh, did I say nurse's station? I meant in the back kitchen area where food's allowed. <laughs> you know, right behind the C. diff precautions. Good, because, you know, Jayco, if you're watching, um, we're down with all the non-open container. Gloves and gowns, gloves mm -hmm. and gowns. So there's gonna be all this stuff in your face, what do you do about it? I say you gotta collect some data first. You have to look at what your habits are. So mm. most people will be very off when they try to think about what they're eating and then mm. actually record what they're eating. So the first thing I tell everyone to do is let's just get an idea of what, you, what you're doing because like you're telling me you eat a donut here or there. I wanna see if you're eating 10 donuts. I wanna see if you're doing it every day. I wanna see if it only happens after a patient dies. Once you start collecting that data, then you can start to see patterns mm. that often don't show themselves when you're trying to randomly recall what you ate for the past week. So I have everybody track everything. And well, look, a nurse just ate six donuts. I'll say, do you think you can eat five and a half donuts next time? That's a lot more tenable for them than if I say, okay, I need you to go not eat donuts for the rest of your life. And while your nurse friends are eating donuts, you're gonna eat a salad mm. with kale. Never gonna happen. Probably not. 
So you do this for a living now. You help people lose weight. You lost weight yourself. I mean, these ideas of incremental changes, do they actually work in real life? They have a higher probability of working than mm. anything else. Mm. So you can't guarantee anything. Right. But if I put 100 people in a room and they all want to lose weight, and all 100 try HCG, maybe 99 of them are going to fail, and that 100 will succeed. If you put that HCG same- HCG is a diet, yeah. Yes, yeah, so any diet, pick yeah, any diet. Pick, pick any South diet. Beach, anything with an endpoint, and then a reintroduction of normal life, which doesn't happen either. Right. Um, if you put 100 people in the room, and you tell them to make a series of small incremental changes, maybe 60 or 70% of them are gonna be successful, uh -huh. which is way better than the 99% failure rate we got going on now. Right, that's, 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 that's exactly correct. These sort of starvation, diets and things like that that are unsustainable, do you see a sort of metabolic rebound from those? I do, but it's not as significant or as long-standing as I thought it was. Mm. Um, what we find is that people are very, very consistent in their underestimating their food intake. Mm. So I see somebody who comes in and said, I've been on the HCG diet, I've starved, I've done Optifast, I'm on 800 calories per day, and now I'm gaining weight even though I'm eating 1,000. Mm. And you really have a heart-to-heart -heart with them, talk mm. about basal metabolic rates and the lowest ones we know about in the 600 to 700 calorie range and like post-stroke victims, mm. and say, I really want you to go out and track everything. You know, that bite of nuts or that handful of nuts, that jelly bean that you took, all counts. And normally they come back and say, oh, I was eating closer to 16 or 1700. So they're just measuring it wrong. Um, yeah. Sometimes, I yeah. mean, there is metabolic slowdown and sure. people are allowed to have major metabolic issues and they, and they show up, but they can be usually found with blood work and sometimes addressed in the case of like insulin resistance, which could potentially cause, you know, a difficult time losing weight. And metformin is an easy, easy fix there. Yeah. Well, let me ask a question. So do you use fitness trackers, calorie trackers, things like that technology? We use MyFitnessPal almost exclusively as our choice of tracking. Mm -hmm. uh, Emily Northington is a nutrition specialist that I work with. is awesome. Mm. Yeah, Emily. <laughs> she looks at everybody's logs in between the visits with me, and then we look at their weights in the morning and then make adjustments based on what we see them doing, how they're doing it, and what their weight does. So there's midstream changes with all of our patients in between my office visits. Uh -huh. The exercise tracking is more important important in terms of documenting progression in whatever routine we have them on. I'm a very big believer in progressive overload or more work output over time because mm. you do want to see something from your exercise program. Mm -hmm. You're doing the same arm curls with eight pound dumbbells for, for two hour. sets of 15, you know, it's not going to do anything and eventually they'll get burnt out mm. and they'll say this isn't doing anything. And the reason it's not doing anything is because it's the same every day. Mm. The body doesn't need to adjust. It's not going to. And this idea that maybe Pro, you know, again, like you said, leanness. So right. some people say, well, it doesn't matter what you eat as long as it's whole food, it's not processed, this and that. Is there any truth to that? Well, I can speak anecdotally in my practice or with my experience in doing this for five years that people who lose weight have better numbers than people who are overweight, no matter what. Mm. So you could take somebody who loses 50 pounds eating Big Macs and ice cream, mm. his C-reactive protein, triglycerides are gonna be lower, insulin level will be lower, HDL will be higher if they're leaner than somebody who sticks to like a whole 30 diet for 365 if they can do it um, and weighs 400 pounds. So it's really the obesity as a, as a driver. I think that there's a, there's a bunch of different factors, mm. but it's very clear that obesity contributes to chronic illness and inflammation. So when there is conflicting data on anything else, I would say, let's go to the thing that makes the most sense or that we have the most data behind. Mm. And we know that if you're obese, your likelihood of dying prematurely is super high, mm. between 50 and 100%. So don't be obese. If it turns out that saccharin kills you, well then maybe you're screwed anyway. But at least you won't definitely be killed by being obese. Boot camps, exercise boot camps. I, I talk to a lot of people who come in and they say, I want to lose weight. I'm working out five days a week. I'm doing boot camp, you know, nothing. I'm like, well, are you stronger? And they're like, well, I don't know. And I say, well, you need to have some sort of measure as to whether you're progressing or not, again, to keep you interested in it. You can't out-exercise a bad diet. It's an old training axiom is you can't outrun a bad diet. Mm. If your nutrition's not in place, nothing's going to happen. So that's I, the base of the pyramid. Yes, but I mean, I want people to look like good referrals for me. And they do that with more traditional weight training, you know, stuff focused around squats, bench presses, deadlifts, overhead presses, and rows. Like we got a full on gym in our office with power racks and dumbbells up to 100 pounds. And we train people to do those basic lifts because in the long run, they'll live longer because there's an independent correlation between strength and longevity. Wow. Um, they'll enjoy it more because it's fun if you're a 55 year old woman to be able to pull 145 pounds off the floor in good form, um, they're more likely to do it. And again, it'll protect from osteoporosis, it'll improve insulin sensitivity, and I'll do so more than the like boot camps or CrossFit type stuff. I and mean, there's also not the potential for getting injured. 
Now, you're a clinical exercise physiologist. Yes. What does that mean? How does that relate to all this? It's an American College of Sports Medicine certification. It's kind of like, pers like a personal trainer on steroids. Bro. So wait, 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 what was I asking you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so clinical, clinical exercise physiology, you're certified in this. Tell me about this. Well, I mean, the certification is to work with people who've had cardiovascular um, incidents uh, to help rehab them and then give them an exercise program. Got it. Um, Got it. Or COPD or people with comorbid conditions. Practically, it doesn't play out um, in my practice that I'm doing that kind of stuff. My exercise physiologist, uh, again, Emily Northington, Emily, rock on. She takes care of the risk stratification um, as far as the people who don't work with me. The people who've worked with me have either undergone cardiovascular workups or I've made the call that they don't need to, you know, and then start a progressive resistance training program. Do you typically do that pre-op yourself or do you rely on cardiology and outsource it? I used to try to do it myself mm -hmm. and then Dr. Brett Victor, who's my boy, is also a cardiologist, explained to me when to order a stress test and when to order a CT coronary angiogram. And mm -hmm. after like two minutes, I was like, they're coming to you. Yeah. Yeah, it gets complicated. So I think that I don't want to step outside my comfort level. I want to know that they're clear, and I want to make sure these people are getting the most appropriate test. I mean, the last thing I need is for a 55-year-old healthy guy to come into my office. I put him on an exercise program, and he has a widow maker and drops dead. Dies. Doesn't yeah. look good for business. No, no. It definitely would uh, affect repeat business from yeah. that same individual. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's fantastic. Drugs for weight loss. I use drugs for weight loss. Mm. Um, like what, I marijuana? Think, I think that uh, marijuana, crack is great. Crack is great. Hey, crystal meth, you ever meet a fat oh. runway model? Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> what real um, drugs do you use? I think that pharmaceuticals definitely have a place in weight loss medicine. I mean, losing weight is so hard as it is. Like, look at Oprah. She has every tool at her disposal. Do I have to look at Oprah? Think of Oprah. Okay. She has every tool at her disposal and still has a difficult time losing weight. If you had kids, stress, job, money issues, whatever, it's going to be almost impossible. So if there's a pharmaceutical that can help, I think it's at least worthwhile to discuss it with patients. Mm -hmm. um, I use fentramine, the old school uh, component of fenfen. Mm. Fenfluramine got the bad rap. Right, with Fenfluramine, the bad drug. Mm. Fentramine, good drug. Probably mm. has one of the best safety efficacy profiles out there. Got it. Um, and is really well tolerated, but is underused and needs to be used as part of a complete plan. Mm. Like we don't change people's calorie numbers based on whether they're taking fentramine or not. Mm. So we don't use it as a means to drive weight super, drive calories super low, which then sets up for rebound. We'll say, you're gonna eat 1,800 calories per day. I want you to take fentramine so that you'd be fine eating 1,200 calories per day. We're gonna make you eat that 1,800. Uh -huh. At the end of the day, that 600 calories of stuff we suggest that people eat what they like to eat when they don't really want it will start to disrupt that habit loop that they formed as food being a reward. So like, this is interesting, I always drink bottle of wine or drink a glass of wine and have pretzels at night before I go to sleep. I don't want to because of the medication, but my doctor's making me. You do it for six months, you stop wanting it. Interesting. So it's a little Jedi mind trick there. I'm not that smart, but if I were a Jedi, absolutely. <laughs> Doc, what do you think about nicotine? As is, there, is there anything nicotine can't do? Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's been my point. There is a prominent weight loss physician who gave a lecture and said that nicotine was the best appetite suppressant out there. And it the really guys are watching like, you can't say that. It is. But though. it is. It is. It is. Uh, you know, nicotine and then what about cannabis? Everybody um, thinks cannabis is a cure for everything. What's right. the deal with cannabis? <sighs> cannabis has no calories in it. That's true. Unless um, you eat it with a brownie. Right. So, yes. So, um, vaping cannabis in places where it's legal or consuming cannabis in a zero calorie situation, if you allot for the calories you would take in after you're done, there's nothing wrong with that. And I personally would rather see somebody in a place where it's legal <coughs> have a little marijuana when they come home from work rather mm -hmm. than have two glasses of wine or two glasses of Jack because of the calories, the fact that it will lower your inhibitions, the drinking, to eat uh -huh. more food uh -huh. and will also disrupt your sleep. Tell me about alcohol. What's your take on it with weight loss? I think that it has to fit in your daily numbers, and if you can make it fit, that's great. Ideally, probably people wouldn't drink, although maybe a glass of red wine might have some cardioprotective benefits, you know, a beer, mm -hmm. and, which is fine. And again, I say if you can make it fit in your daily nutritional goals, then drink up. Mm. You know, if it becomes a problem that you're seeking it or missing work or coming to work drunk or hungover, then obviously that's a different issue. Mm. But strictly from weight loss, if you want to drink, drink because if you try not to you're probably going to fail. Well, what, do you, what do you think of the people who make policy in the country around obesity? 
Without knowing every single one of the people, I would say that there's a big difference between practicing obesity medicine in the real world and doing it behind a research bench. Mm. And there's a lot of things that I think would be great ideas in theory, but they break down in practice. And when you see it on a daily basis, people are a lot likely to look at some of these, a lot more likely to look at some of these guidelines and just say, screw it, I can't follow it, mm. and then do something a little bit more maintainable. Mm. Your practice is in Philadelphia? It is. And you accept patients? I do. And where can people find you? Um, www.drseltzerweightloss.com. That's a mouthful. I like it. We'll put a link in. I love everything that you're doing. I think your, your down-to-earth, practical approach can help a lot of people. There's never a one-size-fits-all, but I've learned a lot talking to you. I mean, any parting words for the Z-Pack? I really appreciate you having me here. This has been awesome. Thank you, brother, Thank for being you so on the much. show. And we out! Give me that.